Okay, before we start, I want to thank um, our partners. Um, number one is uh, Chazak and uh, Yaniv, who's always a tremendous friend of the Shmuz, who's always very helpful, <coughs> always there for us, and I really appreciate their support and everything that they do. I also want to thank <coughs> Torah Anytime for their always being there. Unfortunately, this is not being broadcast live because there's no internet uh, hotspot in Kugan Hills. Kugan Hills is way behind the times, folks. And that's a big bracha because, uh, and believe me, once there's a hotspot here, every kid is going to have an iPod that's accessible to everything. So, um, good. Baruch Hashem, there's still no Wi-Fi hotspots, which is a very good thing. But unfortunately, this year is not going to be broadcast live. Um, I also want to thank the shul, Abba Yisrael, for opening their doors. And um, greatly appreciated their, their support. Who's making noise? That's me. I have ADD folks, if I make noise while I'm doing this, I get all distracted. <laughs> I'd like to uh, dedicate the Shia Le'ilin Nishmas, Yaakov Chaim Ben Noach. At <clears throat> the very last day of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, he addressed the Klai and he began a long litany of everything that would happen if they would follow the ways of Hashem, and everything that would happen if they wouldn't. And the list is very long, and it includes many, many beautiful scenes, many beautiful descriptions, but it also includes some very ugly scenes. And at the very end of it, <clears throat> Moshe Reina said the words, Haidosi bachem hayom, today I'm going to make witnesses, shamayim va'aretz. Let shamayim va'aretz, let the heavens and the earth be my witnesses to everything that I've said till now. Rashi explains what he means. And Rashi explains that actually Moshe Rabbeinu was now providing a tool. I told you the game. I explained to you how great it will be if you serve Hashem, how horrific it will be if you violate the will of Hashem. But now maybe you'll be tempted. Maybe it will be difficult. I want to give you a technique, a tool, to allow you to keep it always in front of you and to allow you to always remember the consequences. What's that technique? Shemayim va'aretz, the sun and the earth. And Rashi explains what that means. <clears throat> Rashi explains that what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying was, look at the sun. Every morning it rises. Every evening it sets. Never once does it say, hmm, I don't want to rise today. I don't think I'll set. Every day it dutifully follows the Ratz and Hashem. Every day the ground produces as it's supposed to. Never once does the ground say, no, I don't think I'm going to produce, or you plant barley and I think I'll produce wheat. It follows dutifully Hashem's command, <clears throat> just as the sun listens, just as the ground listens, so to you, the Kali Yisrael. The sun and the ground receive no reward if they listen, but they do follow Hashem's will. You do receive reward or punishment. Surely you should listen. Use the sun, <clears throat> use the earth as your technique, as your tool to properly serve Hashem. And that's how Rashi explains this Pasuk. The problem with the Rashi, I think, is rather obvious. And that is that the sun follows Hashem's will because it's an inanimate object. Hashem put the sun in the sky and put the planets in orbit around it. And the sun does what it's supposed to do because Hashem put it into that course. It doesn't have free choice. It doesn't have a will. It does what it's supposed to do because that's how it was created. The earth produces because Hashem created laws of nature. Hashem created laws of physics. <clears throat> Hashem created laws of <clears throat> governing all fa facets of physicality. And those laws are such that if you plant a seed in the ground, water it, it will grow. But it's not because the ground decides to produce wheat or not produce wheat. It's not because the ground listens. It's because it's an inanimate object that Hashem created. If so, what does this Rashi mean? How could the clients all look at the sun and say, oh my goodness, if the sun listens, surely I should. Oh, the ground listens, surely I should. The sun and the ground obey because they have no free will. Man is in a very different situation. Man is tempted, man is pulled, man always wants to and doesn't want to, does and doesn't, is pulled between those two opposites. And it sounds rather difficult to understand how Moshe Rabbeinu could offer this as a tool, as a technique, to explain to the clients all that they should listen to Hashem. And I'd like to see this evening if we could better understand this Rashi, and in fact understand what Rashi is telling us. And to do that, let me share with you an interesting observation. 
in our modern world, we are very comfortable with forces that we harness, that we use, but we don't see. We turn on a cell phone, and we're aware that the signal is sent to a tower, then sent to a distant satellite some three miles in the sky. We don't see the waves, but we connect. We talk to friends 6,000 miles away by picking up this little device. We're very comfortable with it. We're very familiar with it. If you break your arm and you go to the hospital, you put your arm under that little gizmo and x-rays are emitted. X-rays penetrate the flesh, but the bone is more dense, the bone blocks it, and the film is sensitive, receives the x-rays going through the fleshy part of your arm, the bones block it, and it creates a silhouette in the film. We're very comfortable with x-rays that we don't see, but we know exist. We plug our appliances into wall outlets. We never see electricity. No human being can see electricity. It's a theory, but a very powerful one, and one that powers our world, and one that very, very clearly is present. You see, we don't sort of kind of think that electricity exists. We know it very, very clearly. Haraya, if I were to offer you $20, to put a key into a wall socket, I doubt you'd accept my offer. Why? Because you know positively, with badoyas, with absolute certainty, that that will end very badly. You've never seen electricity, and you can't really feel it, but you are very certain it exists. You harness it, you use it. We live in a world of invisibility, of forces and powers that my eyes don't see, my ears don't hear, and all of my senses deny, but I'm 100% positive that they exist. Now, I've often wondered, what would happen if you took somebody from a distant generation? Let's say you took somebody from 200 years ago, and you brought him into our modern world. What would his reaction be? So imagine with me for a moment that we took Shmuel, a yeshiva guy. Imagine we took a regular yeshiva guy from 200 years ago, and we brought him to a yeshiva dorm. And we brought him in, let's say, the middle of lunch. <clears throat> Bring him up into the dorm, lunchtime, and he walks into a yeshiva dorm, and there's Rush Limbaugh playing on the radio. What's the doors? What's the doors? He's the mensch. He's the mensch. That's it. That's it. Calm down. Shmiel. Shmiel, take it easy. It's a radio. He's the mensch. Who's the speaker? He's the... Relax. There's a guy 20 miles downtown, 20 miles away. He's speaking into a microphone. And the microphone converts that sound into an electrical impulse. An electrical impulse is sent into radio waves. Those radio waves come into the little box over here, it receives it and plays it. What is a radio wave? Shmiel, it's a big wave. It goes up and down. It goes through walls. It goes right there. And it comes into the, comes into the radio. What's the problem? Oh, but where's the kayak? Where's the kayak that it does? Power, it's electricity. You see, our walls, there are wires running through all of our walls. And in all of our walls there's this power, this energy called electricity, and it powers the radio. Can I see these uh, sound waves, these radio waves? No. Can, can I feel them? No. Can I see this electricity? No. Can, can I, I can feel, I can feel electricity? <laughs> Don't do that, you know. That'll end badly. Now, could you imagine at that moment Shmuel's incredulous sense of wonder. But I'm no, I won't stop there. Shmuel, I want to show you something amazing. Come here. Look at this. See this? It's an egg, right? See this? A bowl. Raw egg. Shmuel, raw, right? I open my microwave, put it in, press three minutes, close it. Ding! And I pull out a fully cooked egg. Machshiva l'sechaya! Kishav, it's Kishav! How do you do? What's the matter? It was a raya egg! What's happening? Nishkanesh, there's no fire! What's the matter? What's the matter? Shmuel could not believe it. There's nothing in his world that would allow him to relate to this, to a transducer that emits microwaves. The microwaves cause the electrons to spin around more quickly. That causes friction. Electrons that we don't see, microwaves that we don't see, that cook an egg. A man from 200 years ago would fall on his face aghast. 
in absolute shock and wonder, how could it be? We, modern man, are very, very sophisticated in physical sciences, in technology, applied sciences, physical dimensions. And as sophisticated as we are in the physical senses, we are clueless in terms of ruchnius. We are clueless in terms of spirituality. The Rambam tells us that every one of the upper world items, every star in the sky, every planet in the sky, has a malach, has a sar, has a spiritual entity that keeps it where it's supposed to be. The moon, the sun, the stars, each have a corresponding spiritual element that guides it, that directs it. That element allows and causes the sun to rise, causes the moon to be where it is, and there's nothing physical without a spiritual counterpart. And the Ramchal in the <coughs> Mamorim explains that nothing in the physical world can exist without a spiritual counterpart to it. Because I'll say that no blade of grass can grow without a mazel telling it to grow. The Ramchal explains that that means no physical entity can possibly exist without a spiritual component keeping it and telling it to grow. Now, if you and I went to a magician's show, we would be fully aware that it's sleight of hand. If a man pulled out a hat, and from his hat a rabbit suddenly appeared, we're well aware that the rabbit was there, a little bit of smoke and mirrors, a little bit of an optical illusion, but we're fully aware that magic doesn't really happen, doesn't really exist. Except, the Sefer Echinach explains that there is a losase for a Jew to be involved in kishuf, machshefelu sechaye, you're obligated to kill one who does kishuf. But the Sefer Echinach explains what is kishuf. He explains that because every physical manifestation in this world has a spiritual counterpart, there are some people, and certainly once upon a time it was more common, for people to be aware as to how to manipulate the spiritual world. Just like you can make electrons spin around more quickly, and just like you can cause electricity to flow through wires, if you're aware of the spiritual dimensions of the world, you can manipulate them and cause physical manifestations. Kishuf is not an optical illusion. Kishuf is not slate of hand. Kishuf is where there was no rabbit and a man made the rabbit appear. There was no cup of water. He said the words, he did whatever he did, and a cup of water appeared. It's not fooling one's eye. It's not achiza seinayim. It's changing the spiritual world, manipulating things. <clears throat> Everything in the physical world is tied to the spiritual world, and it's creating things or bringing changes in the world that wasn't there before. The Mitzrim were very, very learned in Kishuf. As a matter of fact, the Medrash tells us that when Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron came into Paro's palace, Hashem gave them mofsim, gave them signs. One of the signs was that Aaron took that staff, threw it on the ground, and it turned into a serpent. If you or I were there, we would have fallen on our face and said the words, Hashem will Kim. An inanimate object, a solid, powerful rod, <clears throat> falls to the ground and turns into a live snake. It's a miracle beyond explanation, certainly beyond our understanding. The Medrash also tells us that Paro was not particularly impressed. Paro called for his boys, the five and six-year-old boys, the academy kids. Boys, come here. And each one of them took their staffs, took their sticks, threw it on the ground, and it turned into snakes. But not giving the illusion of, not sort of iffy kind of looking like, <coughs> actually becoming into a snake. Why? Because while modern man is very, very schooled in physical properties, in physical sciences, modern man is clueless about the spiritual world, and the ancient Egyptians were very, very learned in that. And what Paro did was tell his boys to do that which they were learning, that which they studied, because the ancient Egyptians were very schooled in these elements of spirituality. 
The Jewish people <coughs> grew up in Mitzrayim. For 210 years, we lived in Egypt. And because we lived there for 210 years, we were very, very familiar with these things. <coughs> we were very, very comfortable seeing these things and very much aware of it. When Hashem took us out of Egypt, and Hashem brought us to Har Sinai, brought us to <coughs> that moment of receiving the Torah, Chazal tell us that Hashem opened Shemayim Ba'aretz, Hashem opened up the heavens, and we were able to see. But you see, what we saw wasn't just Hashem's existence, and we saw spirituality in a very, very complex, very, very real way. And what the Jews saw then was that there was actually a war of ideology. You see, Paro and Moshe were engaged in a battle. Paro said, there are many gods, there are many forces. And Paro's people were very skilled, very learned in much of spirituality. What Moshe Rabbeinu was saying was, that's correct. But Hashem is the creator of it all. And Hashem is the sustainer of it all. And every spiritual force that exists was put into motion, kept in existence by Hashem. But that was the vikua, that was the debate. And what the Jewish nation saw at Har Sinai was that Hashem is the creator, maintainer, sustainer of all of physicality. They saw the spiritual world, they saw the upper world, they saw that every physical component has a spiritual element, and they saw at the center of this huge, complex spiritual world the creator, Hashem himself, and they had a revelation and an understanding that mankind hasn't had since. One more step. In davening, we describe the honor given to Hashem. If you pay attention to the words between Baruch Hu and Shmon Esrei, we describe the legions of angels who sing Hashem's praise. On Rosh Hashanah, we describe millions and millions of angels, thousands and thousands of groups, each group containing millions of angels, all singing Kadosh, 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 singing out Hashem's glory. Okay. Here's the following question. Imagine I take a, an MP3 player, and I hook up a speaker, and another speaker, and another speaker, and another, and another, and a tenth, a million speakers. <clears throat> and I play the MP3 player, and the words come out, Kadosh, 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 Hashem, you are glorious, Hashem, you are holy. How much covered Hashina, how much honor to Hashem's name is there in that? <laughs> Not much, because it's, an MP3 player and a million speakers. There, there's nothing there. So here's the question. What great glory is it to Hashem's name if uh, uh, an angel, two angels, ten angels, a thousand, a hundred, a million angels all say the words. They're robots. They're automatons. They're not <laughs> free thinking. So they say words because they're like a boombox that say words that they're programmed to say. Where's the glory to Hashem's Shekhinah? you like to know the answer to that? The Rambam tells us that every malach, every spiritual entity is a das nifrad, a separate, independent, knowledgeable, will-directed entity. Meaning to say, a malach is not a robot. An angel is not an automaton. It's a brilliant, thinking entity, separate from Hashem, with its own will, with its own agenda, it listens to Hashem because it's brilliant and it perceives the consequences and therefore it follows Hashem's will, but it has free will, it could choose to listen or not. And this is something that the Jewish nation saw at the foot of Har Sinai. And I believe that's the answer to this Rashi. <clears throat> you see, Moshe Rabbeinu was speaking to a very sophisticated, very advanced audience, albeit not in physical sciences, but in the spiritual world, very, very advanced. These people had seen the Torah given, and they saw the spiritual world, and Moshe Minah said to him, do you see the sun? The sun has a malach, and has a spiritual component that makes the sun rise. That spiritual component has free will. It could choose to listen or not, yet it listens. Why? Because it recognizes that everything that Hashem says is for its good. Every commandment that Hashem said is for the good of and that entity and the good of the world. The ground always listens. Do you know why? There's a spiritual element to the ground. It could choose to listen, it could choose not to listen, but it listens. Why? Because it recognizes the good that Hashem commands it in. You, the Jewish nation, 
You have in front of you the opportunity to do what's right, what's good, what's proper, or the opposite. Look at the sun, look at the earth. They obey, they have free will, they choose to listen, and because of that, use that as a tool, use it as a technique. And I believe that's exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying to the Jewish nation. And they saw it, they understood it, and in fact it was a technique and a tool for them to use. Now, you may say to me that this is interesting, but what's it got to do with us? What does it have to do with my life, my world? What relevance is this to us? So I'd like to share with you that I believe that this is fundamentally relevant, and I'll explain to you why. Medrash tells us that when Hashem created Adam, Hashem said to Adam, Pay careful attention not to destroy my world. Hashem showed him a beautiful garden. <clears throat> Gan Eden was the most exquisite, perfect entity. Hashem showed him a beautiful world. Everything that was created, everything was detailed, everything perfectly in balance. Pay careful attention that you don't destroy my world. The Ramchal tells us that when Odom Arishan sinned, he literally destroyed the world. The Ramchal explains that death was not a punishment. It wasn't like, oh, you're a bad guy, you ate from the <clears throat> the tree of knowledge, so I'm going to in- inflict a punishment, death upon you. The Ramchal explains that basically, Odom Arishan ruined the world. He ruined the world such that Hashem had to institute this new system, death, then Olam HaNashamas, in time when you're separated from the body, then a reincarnation, because the current world was destroyed from its proper existence, it can no longer serve the purpose that Hashem created it for. When Adam Arishan sinned, he didn't just sin, he took the world and he ruined it, such that Hashem had to come up with, so to speak, a plan B, a different system, a very different world. Here's the question. How can you destroy a world? How powerful was this man? One man, a huge planet. This planet, 24,000 miles around. <clears throat> it's a landmass. There are trees, there are rivers, there are rocks, there are oceans. How could one man be so powerful that he destroys a world? What does that mean? And I'd like to share with you what <clears throat> I believe Chazal are telling us there. And the way to do that is for us to become a little bit, um, as psychologists say, self-aware. Let's spend a few minutes studying us, studying the human experience, and trying to become a little bit aware of who we are. And how do we do that? <clears throat> Let me start with a simple question. If I were to ask you, what is the difference between you and a malach? Right? What's the difference between you and an angel? So <clears throat> most people instantly say, me and an angel, come on, I mean... I'm a malach is spiritual and, and I'm physical. I mean, there's, there's no comparison, right? Wrong. Well, a malach is spiritual and you are equally spiritual. Don't mistake you for your body. If you put on Michael Jordan's uniform, that doesn't make you a great basketball player. If you're housed in a physical entity, it doesn't make you physical. You're wearing a suit of clothing like an astronaut who wears that spacesuit, it doesn't define him, it doesn't limit him. We get into a habit of defining ourselves by our temporary physical manifestations, and we get so comfortable with that that we think that we're physical, and we forget the fact that I'm the guy inside, I'm the one who thinks, I'm the one who feels, and I am not physical, I am spiritual. Let me share with you sort of an exercise to bring this home. One of the great debates, one of the great challenges in ethics today is defining death. How do you define death? Is it when respiration stops? Is it when there's a brain stem death? How do you define death? And there are many manifestations, many issues that come out with it. And it is a rather, rather difficult quandary. I'd like to share with you, it shouldn't be much of a question, you should have a very simple definition. I am the guy inside. When I leave, I'm dead. What's so hard to define? It's very simple. As long as I'm in the body, I'm alive. Once I'm outside the body, I'm dead. Why is it so difficult to define death? Would you like to know why? Because I don't exist 
in a physical dimension. <laughs> and I'll share with you what I mean. <laughs> you see, I, the person inside, I, the guy who thinks, <clears throat> I, the guy who remembers, do not exist in a physical realm. You can't take me out and weigh me. You can't take me out, put me into a beaker, add blue dye, and see what color I turn, because I don't exist in a physical sense. If you'd like to understand why it's so difficult to define death with physical tools, imagine the following. Imagine I walk into a Home Depot, and I walk over to the counter and say, um, can I get a, a, a pound of light? And the guy goes, huh? A pound of light. I need a, a pound of light. Huh? A pound of light. What are you saying? Come on, listen. My dining room is dark. I figure about a pound is, is what I need. Could I have a pound of light? The guy is going to have a problem with my request. Why? Because luminosity is a measurement of light. You can measure light by candle power. But you can't measure light by weight. It's the wrong system of measurement. The reason why science has such difficulty defining death is because I don't exist in a physical realm. You can't measure I. You can't weigh me. You can't measure me. I don't exist in a physical sense. And that's the strangest concept you've ever thought about. What do you mean, I don't exist? Of course I exist. I mean, I've always existed. Since I've, since I've been born, I've existed. What do you mean, I don't exist? My body exists in a physical sense. My heart my lungs, my stomach, I the one inside, and I the one who tell my arms and legs to move, I the captain of the ship, do not exist in a physical sense, but I know I exist because, gee golly, I sure am here. And now you come to one of the first steps of self-awareness, and that is the difference between me and an angel is not that an angel is spiritual and I am physical, quite different. He's spiritual, and I am spiritual. <clears throat> if you would like to know what is the difference between a human being and an angel, the Ramchal explains to us that there are two major differences. And the first difference is something that the Ramchal calls hergation, feelings. Now, when we think of feelings, we think of those as the higher dimension of the human being. Love, empathy, compassion. We look at those as the higher part of the human and we look at them as very, very illustrious and beautiful parts. Now, while that may be true to some extent, I'd like to share with you that really hergation feelings are not the greatness of the human. And let me explain to you what I mean. If it could be, one of the problems that Hashem had when he was creating man was, how do you give man bechira? How do you give man free will? You see, free will means I could just as easily do this and just as easily do that. I could or I couldn't, I could or I couldn't, and I choose. But here's the problem. I am an Hashemah. I was under the Kisya covered, I was under Hashem's throne of glory, and I, the Hashemah, am brilliant, incisive, I see consequences, and I understand with absolute clarity of knowledge the result of what I do. How do you take a brilliant Hashemah and give it free will. Let's say I were to offer you $100 to drink a cup of bleach. I don't think you'd take me up on it. Oh, come on, like $1,000 to you know, down a, a jug of Clorox. You wouldn't do it. Why? Because it's foolish. It's self-inflicted damage. It's, it's not the kind of thing that you would do. How do you take a brilliant neshama and offer it free will when every mitzvah that Hashem gave us is for my benefit? Every sin damages me. Every mitzvah helps me, <clears throat> allows me to become greater. How could you give free will to such a brilliant, insightful neshama? There's no human being who would ever sin. And if it could be, to solve that problem, Hashem put the human being not just into a physical container, not just into a body, <clears throat> but Hashem mixed us up into a nefesh bahami, into a physical soul, an animal soul, <clears throat> and one of the things that that animal soul has is hergation, feelings, emotions. And if you'd like to understand what that means, I'll give you a marshal. It's not, not so popular anymore, but it used to be that uh, yeshiva guys would get drunk on Purim. Okay, why don't you imagine that you see a young yeshiva guy, we'll call him, let's say, an 18-year-old uh, fellow, he's a first year based medrash, and it's the first year that he's getting and he's gotten drunk, and he's uh, pretty gone. Purim day, and he's plastered. 
And you see him out on the street, and he's playing in traffic. Shmuel, I'm uh, What are you doing, Moshe? Oh, you're, 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 you're going to hit by a car. I know, I'm playing with a pretty car. Moshe, you're going to get hit by one of those cars. I know, smack, crack, break my back. Moshe, you're going to get hit by a car and they're going to send you to the hospital. I know, I go to the hospital. The doctors put pins, pins in my bones and put me back. Then I go to the, to the metal detector in the airport. Ding, ding. <laughs> What's going on? Is he alert? Is he conscious? He spoke about the consequences. He mentioned the fact of broken bones. <clears throat> he even did the equation of broken bones, pins inside, metal detector. Is he conscious? Is he alert? Is he intelligent? The answer is he's drunk. He's kind of like uh, <clears throat> there and kind of not there. He understands the consequences, kind of, and kind of doesn't. If you'd like to understand yourself, the first thing you have to understand is that we are drunk. Do you ever notice we can mouth the words, Hashem runs the world. There is no pain that is ever meted out that is not directed by Hashem. And it's good and well, and I can give a sheer in it until I'm walking down the street, some guy steps out from the corner, where's my amunah, where's my betachan, where's my understanding that Hashem runs the world? You see, we get it and we don't get it. We understand and we don't understand. And the reality is that we are drunk, constantly alert and not alert, constantly recognizing consequences. We could stand there on a Shoshana davening, literally pouring out our heart to Hashem, speaking right there, and a minute later, oh, I wonder what my wife's making for lunch. I hope I'm going to, oh, wait, I'm being judged for my life. And I hope it's hopes. What are you, are you real? The answer is we're uh, sort of real and sort of not, we're sort of drunk and sort of not drunk. Now, if you're a little bit of a student of drinking, you'll note that there are different intoxicating beverages. There's beer, there's wine, and there's whiskey. And each one has a different changing effect on your consciousness. Because I'll tell us, Yayan Yismach Levav Enosh, if you do drink on Purim, you should drink wine because it has a certain way of intoxicating you in a better, more spiritually inclined method. But beer, wine, and whiskey color your thinking in a different way. If you'd like to understand yourself, do you ever notice when you get angry? It's not just that you're angry, you think differently. That fellow who used to be a friend of yours is such a creep. And that sin, called embarrassing another Jew in public, now is not such a big deal. And after what he's done, and after what he said, he deserves. And when you're angry, it's not just that you feel differently, you view things differently, you think differently. When you're envious, I'm so jealous. I look at the world with a different set of eyes. I look at people differently. I think differently. If you can imagine that sometimes I have clear vision and then there's a color filter that's put in front of me. Sometimes it's red and I see everything red. Sometimes it's green and I see everything green. That's what we human beings go through. Our emotions, our hergation, our feelings color our perspective, color our sight. We're drunk, sometimes regularly drunk, and sometimes drunk with greed, sometimes with envy, but we're constantly in this flux, in this change, and that which we view as the higher part of the human actually isn't, and is actually something that blinds our brilliant side, and changes our clear sight, and doesn't allow us to fully function in the greatness that we're supposed to. So the first difference between a human being and an angel is hergation, emotions, feelings. The Ramchal explains to us there's a second difference. And the second difference is that a malach doesn't have chushim, doesn't have senses. We have senses. I see, I hear, I feel, I taste, I smell. A malach has none of those. Now, on one level, these chushim, these senses, are dramatic and remarkable. I reach into my pocket and I could feel soft or hard cold or hot, smooth or rough. There's a sensitivity in my fingertips that brings me the world. I could hear things that I can never see. From a mile away I could hear a sound and I'm aware of it. Sight. 
is the most remarkable feature. I could look at distant items and I could see colors and textures, movements, dynamics. It's a wonderful thing. And in one sense, senses are very impressive and senses are very, very beautiful. But in a very real sense, they're extraordinarily limiting. And I'll explain to you what I mean. Imagine that you want to go deep sea diving, but I mean deep sea diving. You get into one of those compression bells and you go down, down, down. At about a thousand feet, it begins getting very, very dark. You have a window in the compression bell that is oxygen being pumped in, and you're able to see, but again, it's beginning to very little sunlight. And then you hit 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet, you get to 20,000 feet, and it's almost pitch black. There's almost no sunlight. You could barely see outside some kind of murky sort of things. You see something that looks like some sort of aquatic animal passing, and you could see things, and you say, wow. This window is glory. Look at this. I could look out into the world. It, it, it's amazing what I could see. That's a muscle. That's a parable to sight. You see, imagine that the man in that compression bell <clears throat> sees in a very dark world, in a very, very limited fashion, is then brought up to the surface. And they open the hatch. And he sees the sun. And he's able to see for miles and miles and miles with a brilliant clarity of vision. What a malach sees, what an angel sees is from one end of the earth to the other. He's not limited by physicality. We're enveloped in layers and layers of physicality that blinds us. I can't see but two inches in front of my eyes. Because I'm so swallowed up in this body, I need these senses, these eyes, these ears, to bring me some input from the outside world. That's how I relate to the outside world. But it's because I'm swallowed up in this body, and because I'm temporarily housed in this body, that I need these sensory inputs. When I leave my body, I have yadiyah brura, absolute knowledge, complete understanding, not hazy, not limited, not sort of <clears throat> confused with an absolute total clarity of thinking. Okay, now that's the difference between me and a malach, to me and an angel. We're both spiritual, but the key distinction is that a malach isn't subjected to these feelings and emotions, one time wanting this, one time wanting that, he's not drunk. And number two, a malach has absolute clarity brilliant perception and understanding because he doesn't have to relate to the world through these limitations called senses. What does it have to do with other Mauritian? What does it have to do with destroying the world? I'd like to explain to you something that I think is key, fundamental, but the only way I could do it is I have to bring back our buddy Shmuel. Remember the guy who was 200 years ago, the yeshiva guy? I want to bring him back to our world, but now I want to show Shmuel the wonders of technology. And imagine I bring Shmuel back, and I say, Shmuel, come here, buddy, come here. I'm going to show you the world. Come in here. I open a door, I put him down, and I take this strap, and I strap him in. What's the Why are you tying me in? Relax, Shmuel. I'm taking you for a ride. And I get behind the wheel, and start the car, and I begin driving. He goes, he gets, he's the fair. Where's the horse? Shmuel, relax. No horses. It's a modern world. There's an engine. 200 horsepower. 200 horses. Leave me. Leave the, wait the 200. Shmuel, take it easy. And then we start driving. And I start driving. 10 miles an hour. 15 miles an hour. Keep in mind that Shmuel, in his world, never went more than 20 miles an hour. On horseback, maybe he hit 25. I begin accelerating onto the highway. 25, 30, 35, 45, oh, what's going on, the trees are going so fast, they're by so fast, oh, what's going on, what's going on, Shmuel, take it easy, we're going to hit 70, oh, 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 I can't breathe, I can't breathe. In his entire life, he never saw the world go by so fast, and there's a reality that's shocking to him, and I'm driving at 70 miles an hour, and he's trembling away, and I want to offer him a valley, take it easy, Shmuel, it'll be okay, we'll get there, and slowly I stop braking, and I pull up, and we stop. And Shmuel goes, Hi, Baruch Hashem, we're here. Hi, uh, uh, Shmuel, take it easy. What, what, the, the horses, you, you're going to give them to drink now? And that's not horses, Shmuel, it's horse. Come here, Shmuel. I get Shmuel out. <clears throat> Come here, Shmuel, I want to show you something else. Now I take Shmuel into a Piper Cub. A little tiny airplane, right? 
I put them in, again I scrap them, I get behind the wheel, I turn on the engine, and the propeller starts turning around. Well, what's the middle around, around, around? Take it easy, Shmiel, we're going somewhere. And all of a sudden, the plane starts moving. 10 miles an hour, 20, now Shmiel knows the game. I got another car, I'm not scared, no, he's not impressed. But as we hit 30, and we hit 40, and we hit 50, we hit 70, at 99 miles an hour, the wheels start lifting, and we start going up. Let's get on the, let's get on. We start getting airborne, and she goes, I'm not a bird, what are you doing to me? Shmiel, take it easy, we're flying. And I begin flying in the air, in the air, without wires, without cables, and Shmiel in his wildest dreams can never imagine, never understand, and I say to Shmiel, this is nothing. This is nothing. I'm going to show you the wonders of the modern world. And I fly over an industrial park and I land. And I say to Shmiel, Shmiel, you see all of these buildings? All of these buildings are factories. Now I'm going to show you progress. I'm going to show you the industrial revolution. Come with me. And I bring Shmiel into a factory. It's a factory that makes suits. And in the room out there, there are racks and racks and racks and racks of suits. And I say to Shmiel, Shmiel, count them. How many suits do you see? And he counts and he counts, about a thousand. Shmiel, tell me, in your world, how long would it take a tailor to sew a thousand suits? It's a thousand suits. He's got to weave the material and sew the lining. The inner, it's about a month a suit, uh, about ten a year. It would take him, uh, I guess, a uh, hundred years. Shmiel, in this world, one man flicks a switch, and in one hour, a machine produces a thousand suits. Down the road is a shoe factory. Thousands and thousands of shoes produced on a conveyor belt, and one after another after another. Go further down the road, there's a furniture manufacturer. And go further down the road, there's an automobile manufacturer. You're looking at the wonders of progress. In everything that Shmuel has experienced till that point, there is no ability for him to relate to this. No frame of reference that will allow him to understand such production. And again, one of the ironies of our very sophisticated world, of our great level of understanding, is that we are very, very attuned to the physical world, and we are clueless to the spiritual world. What Hashem was saying to Adam Arishan was, I am putting the world in your hands. The keys to creation are in your hands grasp. Everything physical exists because Hashem keeps it in existence. And Hashem is the creator, maintainer, and sustainer of all of physicality. When Hashem said Vayahi in a hundred billion galaxies, each one containing a hundred billion stars came into existence, it wasn't just an act of creation. It was an act of creation that requires constant infusion of energy, constantly keeping it there, constantly keeping physicality where it is. And when Hashem created Adam and put man into this world, Hashem said, you are now a little creator. What that means is, I am giving you over the control of the spiritual worlds. <clears throat> the spiritual worlds are going to be dependent upon you. They're going to need your infusion of energy. They're going to need your holiness. It's going to be your acts that keep them alive or destroy them. And when Odomarishan was given the keys to creation, effectively what he did was he wrecked the spiritual world, hence the physical world went with it, and there was nothing that Hashem could do if it could be other than change creation in a radical way. And I believe that this is a very eye-opening concept. If we human beings ever understood our power, our impact, what we could affect, what we could change, we would be dazzled. We'd be mesmerized by the strength, power, and impact that I have. You ever notice that mitzvahs are so exact? If your tefillin are perfect, but there's one letter that's cracked, you didn't fulfill the mitzvah. A perfect lulav, beautiful esrog, but there's a crack in the center of the lulav that goes... Roll it away down, you're not Yotzin and Mitzvah. Why? 
Why such punctiliousness? Why such exactness? What are you getting all bent out of shape for? And there's a direct spiritual entity, a tremendous impact in the spiritual world. We human beings are very clued into the physical world and we're clueless, clueless as to the spiritual world. <clears throat> Chazal understood it. And when Adam Marishan was given the hands to creation, he was given the control of the spiritual world and effectively he destroyed the spiritual world, destroyed the physical world. And I think it's an eye-opening understanding to the impact that we have, to the power that we have, to the effects that our simple actions have. And when a human being acts as he's supposed to, when a person does a chesed, does a favor, when a person acts in an appropriate way, it's not just the physical world that changes. It's an entire upper world, an entire spiritual entity, and it changes everything above. I believe what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying to the Jewish nation is, look at the sun and look at the earth. They obey Hashem's commandments. Why? They have free will. They're guided by a spiritual entity. There's a malach, there's an angel that makes the sun rise every morning. It obeys Hashem's commands, not because it has to. It could disobey, it doesn't have to listen. It's a das nifrod. Why does it listen? Because it recognizes that everything Hashem tells it to do is for its good. Look at the earth. Every time you plant barley, barley is what it produces. Every time you plant wheat, wheat grows. The earth is guided by a spiritual entity. Why does it listen? Because it recognizes that Hashem's ways are good. It recognizes that it's the right way. The Jewish nation were on such a spiritual plane at the time and that they saw the sun, saw the earth, recognized the spiritual components to it, and that was a tool, that was a technique that changed their reality, and that's why Moshe Rabbeinu told them about it, and that's in fact why he gave this as a technique for them to be motivated. I think we human beings have a lot to understand. We live in a very physical world. We think that this physical world is so real. And at the same time, we recognize that it's temporary. How long do I spend on this planet? Not that long. What do I have left? 10 years? 20 years? I guess it depends on your statistical average, where you're holding, and what you really believe. But there's no question that every one of us will leave this earth. But I will live on forever. My body is put in the ground. I, the guy inside, I, the one who tell my arms and legs to move, separate, and for eternity, I am what I shape myself into. But when I leave this body, there's a sudden revelation, a sudden clarity of thought, a totally different understanding. Everything becomes brilliantly, brilliantly clear. I'm no longer drunk, I'm no longer pulled by every different emotion. I'm no longer in this ups and downs and not remembering where I am and what I am with a brilliant clarity of understanding. I get it, I understand. And then I recognize what I did with my short time on the planet. And I recognize the powerful worlds, the upper worlds that are affected, that are changed by my actions, by my thoughts. I recognize the astonishing things that I accomplished. I recognize that we live in a world of factories. Much like our fellow Shmiel who could not understand how you could turn a button and produce a thousand suits an hour, in our physical world, we can't understand the impact that a human being can have. And we don't understand how one little action that I do can change the world. And we can't understand how one man can destroy a whole world. But that's because we live in a very unsophisticated, very primitive understanding. <clears throat> if we were able to understand the upper worlds, if we were able to understand what effects it has, we would look at life very differently. We'd look at every action we engage in very differently. We'd be tuned into a whole different dimension of existence. I want to close with one last thought. <clears throat> one last observation. We describe <clears throat> every Rosh Hashanah a certain tefillah. <clears throat> we ask Hashem during the Tkiyah Shofar, during the blowing of the Shofar, let the Molochim that come out of the Shofar be Ola Lefanechel Tov, that the angels that are created by the blowing of the shofar should stand in front of you for good. Now, you and I, when we watch the man blowing the shofar, don't see angels coming out of the ram's horn. We see a ram's horn, we hear a voice, and we are clueless to the entire world. We live in a very, very limited, very tiny perspective, and we only see what our eyes tell us, what our hearing brings to us, and we are clueless. 
Chazal tell us that every single action that you engage in, every thought, every conversation, every discussion with another human being creates a spiritual entity, <coughs> creates an angel for good or for bad, but no act remains without a spiritual dimension created from it. So, <coughs> I've often wondered, what's it like when I leave? What, what happens when my job's done? My body's put in the ground, I stand in front of Hashem, stand in front of the Beis Din Shemal of the Heavenly Tribunal, what does it look like? So, <coughs> I've had the following thought every once in a while, and I think it's an interesting concept. Imagine the following. Imagine my body's put in a box, put in the ground, I separate, and before I go into the heavenly tribunal, I'm waiting there, and this brilliant, powerful, shining malach comes out, huge, glorious, walks over to me, and I'm trembling. And he says the words, Shalom Aleichem Tati. My father, welcome. Father, I got six kids, you don't look like any of them. What was father? You, you don't remember me? No. You don't remember the time when there was a widow, she needed help, and you very, very generously dedicated a day of your life? You created me when you did that. Okay, he walks by. Behind him walked another powerful, brilliant malach. Shalom Aleichem Tati. Tati, who are you? Oh, you don't remember me? No. And you remember the time when you were learning with beautiful dedication and it was a younger fellow who needed help? You stopped your learning to help him? You created me. Malach after malach, brilliant and powerful and shining, come one after another. Shalom Aleichem Tati. Hello, welcome. Hello, my father. Hello, my creator. You made me. You shaped me. Thank you. One after another after another. An army. But then one comes, it's a little bit uh, darkened. <clears throat> and then one comes, it's kind of limping. One comes without an arm. Who are you? Oh, you don't remember the day when you didn't wear tefillin? Oh, I'm the guy you created then. You don't remember me? The mangled lips? That was the time you spoke Lashon Hara. And some come in blackened, some come in dark as coal, some come in every color, shape, and form. But here's the point. At that moment, I recognize that every action that I engage in creates a spiritual force, creates a malach. And at that moment, when it's a bit too late, I recognize that I was put in a position of power. I was given machines and spiritual factories to create worlds, to create these powerful things, more powerful than our Shmiel could ever imagine. You turn a button and it cranks out thousands and thousands, millions, powerful, powerful angels. If we human beings could ever wake up from our drunken stupor, if we could ever understand the impact of our actions, we would live a very different life. And that is, I believe, the great challenge of our existence. <clears throat> Hashem grant us the wisdom, understanding, and ability to put it into practice. If anyone has questions, you have to I'd be more than happy. We have to discuss it. Also, one thing I want to mention, I have copies here of the Stop Surviving, Start Living book. If you haven't gotten a chance to look at this, it's a, um, Baruch Hashem, it's become a very popular book. It's sold now at 10,000 copies. It's, um, I, I like to call it the Silasham uh, for the 21st century. It deals with all of the issues of a person dealing in our world. Why does Hashem create me? What's life about? Why is there suffering? I have copies available outside, available for $10 a copy. Um, please, uh, please take a few moments to look it over, and if you want, you can just leave money in the box. There are also tapes, CDs, etc. over there. And again, I want to thank our partners, and uh, thank you for joining us.